Hello, and welcome to the Providence College Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Hagan of the Class of 2015, and I'm joined by producer Chris Judge of the Class of 2005. Here at the Providence College Podcast, we bring you interesting stories and perspectives from around the Fryer family. This week, we're speaking remotely with Dr. Holly Taylor Kuhlman, Assistant Professor of Theology and Chair of the Theology Department, and Dr. Dana Dillon, Associate Professor with a Joint Appointment in Theology and Public and Community Service Studies, currently serving as Associate Director of the Development of Western Civilization Program. Drs. Kuhlman and Dillon both earned their doctorates in theology at the Divinity School at Duke University and teach here at Providence College. We're talking today about Holly and Dana's experiences with self-quarantine, social distancing, and remote instruction, as well as what wisdom theology, especially Catholic social teaching, offers each of us as we navigate the COVID-19 pandemic and do our parts to stop the spread. Holly and Dana, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for the invitation, Michael. Holly, yours was one of the first families in Rhode Island to self-quarantine. What led to that decision, and what was it like to take that step before many had even considered how the coronavirus would disrupt everyday life and work? Right, so that happened pretty suddenly for us. It was more than three weeks ago now, um, in a way that seems like a lifetime ago, uh, more than three weeks ago that we got a phone call from our state's Department of Health telling us that our two high schoolers had been exposed to the new coronavirus um, through their high school. Um, We were given instructions right away that they needed to move into self-quarantine immediately. And given the flexibility of our work situations, my husband and I decided that it probably made the most sense for us to quarantine with them and for our whole family to just enter into this experiment of staying home. Um, So that was quite a bit earlier than most folks had started that process, although now we've been joined by many others. How did your children react to the decision to go under self-quarantine? I think like a lot of teenagers and young adults, uh, their first reaction was one of resistance. They like to see their friends. Um, Even in the year 2020, I think virtual contact sometimes doesn't really feel like enough. Uh, at the same time, and maybe you could say at the other end of the spectrum, they had some moments of, of panic almost. Again, this was very early in this process. Uh, they, they themselves had very little information about the virus at that point. And so we found that they were sort of bouncing back and forth between um, protesting the kind of restrictions that they were living under and then uh, looking at my husband or at myself and saying, what if I have this virus? What What's going to happen next? So we were trying to process with them both of those possibilities. And now you mentioned that when the health department called, um, the instructions were for your two children to go under quarantine, um, but the whole family decided to go under quarantine along with them. I was struck by a quote from your daughter in America Magazine in a feature that you wrote um, when she said, but mom, I need hugs. Uh, Was there a similar reaction from your other children to the prospect of quarantine? (laughs) <laughs> That's funny. I was just thinking about how that quote is probably something that a lot of us could say at this point. I think we all uh, sort of need a hug about this point in the process. Um, I think uh, my it turns out that in our family, my daughter is especially connected to me, and she really does depend on that kind of uh, physical connection on a daily basis. Um, the two other kids who, younger uh, who are at home with us are both boys, and neither one of them said that out loud. Uh, but I can tell you that I think both of them along the way in the days since we got that announcement have definitely needed that hug. So, um, right. We just decided that knowing just a little bit in general about viruses and their transmission that um, as a way of being extra cautious uh, and also as a way of kind of being with them in that situation that we would go that direction. And what were the first few days of quarantine like in the Kuhlman household? <laughs> um, you know, they were really very odd. Uh, again, nobody else was doing anything like that around us. And certainly the children found themselves just forgetting that they were supposed to be under quarantine. So they weren't attending school. Um, other regular activities had been canceled, but they often 
uh, would ask suddenly if they could go hang out with several friends. Um, I think maybe my children are not the only young people who have found those kinds of uh, instincts kicking in. And so it was, it was hard in those first few days. I had to keep reminding them. I really wanted to do that without suggesting to them that it had to do with something that was wrong with them in a deeper sense or that they were dangerous in some um, kind of eerie way, but just that it was the way for us to um, use our best judgment and go forward in the safest way. So I just kept um, just kept reminding and we started to try to carve out some new habits. And um, how has everybody since those first few days been handling all of the extra time together? <laughs> well, it's a challenge and a blessing, I guess I would say both at the same time. You know, it's funny, and again, in a way, we are still in a sense, a little further along in this experiment than everyone else is. What happened after that was that um, actually our, our uh, kids' entire school was closed for two weeks. And then at the start of the third week, on the day that their school was to reopen, a day that they had really been looking forward to, um, that was the day on which all Rhode Island schools were closed. So um, they've really had a longer, and, and our whole family has had a longer road here. And I think we've seen kind of different phases in that. Um, we've certainly seen uh, teenagers who were happy to have the opportunity to sleep in a little bit later. Um, and we've seen uh, happily, I would say, many ways in which our kids have actually enjoyed being at home and enjoyed being with each other, have been hanging out and starting to take up different projects together. We have more than one child in our family who really likes making music. So that's something that they like to do together. But I have to be honest, we've seen ebbs and flows. And there are some days where at the end of the day, it just feels really hard. And we have to sort of um, give ourselves a little bit of space and give ourselves a little bit of grace and remind all, all everybody in the household that we'll sleep on it and we'll get up tomorrow and we'll try again the next day, really taking it one day at a time, you could say. Now we've all been uh, spending, or many of us have had the opportunity to spend more time with our loved ones as a result of this. Of course, we wish it were under different circumstances, um, but have there been any favorite, mo favorite or otherwise memorable moments from your quarantine experience so far? <laughs> I think um, I would say that I myself got a real kick out of seeing the music video that my three kids got together and produced. They somehow managed to get flashing disco lights going in the basement along with some of their favorite music. And there were some um, surprising leaps and gymnastics that were part of that video. Um, but I think that was probably one of the best things that they could do to get out some energy and get out some, uh, use some creativity to survive what they were trying to survive. Um, and I'll say this too, you know, these are individual moments with individual kids, but both my husband and I have remarked that we have actually found ways to reconnect with our kids one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I indicated now we have several kids at home and it's not always easy to do that, but we do have more time. And so things that that might fall by the wayside in a more normal schedule, things like connecting with individual kids for a conversation or a walk or a card game are things that now can find a place in our schedule. Now you're of course, both theologians and Christian teaching of course has much to say about what it means to be a neighbor and what it means to be a member of a social body, whether that's in a time of stability or whether that's in a time of crisis. Dana, you teach Catholic social thought to undergraduates. What are the principles at the core of that social tradition? So, uh, when I when I teach Catholic social thought, I always uh, include a couple of uh, chapters from the Compendium of the Social Doctrine of the Church, which is a great compilation of the key teachings. And in that book, and in that book, the uh, the the Pontifical Council for Justice really articulates four key principles. The first is the dignity of every human person, without exception. And then the third, which kind of follow from it, are the common good, subsidiarity, and solidarity. And um, just to take a, a moment and talk a little bit more about those, um, 
when we talk as Catholics, when we talk about the dignity of every human person, we're, we really root that first and foremost in the fact that every human person is created in the image and likeness of God. And as such, we all have an inherent dignity. I like to remind my, my students, though, that a lot of times when we say that, we think about each individual person made in the image of an individual God. And of course, that is not the right understanding of it for us as Catholics and for other Christians as well. We believe in a God who's a trinity, that is, a God who is a communion of persons. And in the same way, when we talk about the dignity of human persons, we're talking about uh, our dignity not only as each of us personally, but each of us as always already in relationship. Um, and that's really important for where the church comes down with the rest of the principles of Catholic social thought. We believe in a principle of the common good, where the common good is not, as it is often talked about in the rest of society, as the greatest good for the greatest number or, or something like that. But rather, the common good is the good of all, and the good of each. And it's understood in such a way that because our goods are so intrinsically connected to one another, uh, the good of all and the good of each are not in competition with one another, but are actually mutually constitutive of one another. Now with the undergrads, I often say, wait, now what do we mean by mutually constitutive, right? But that of course means that the good of all being met is part of what makes it possible for the good of each to be met and vice versa, that they constitute one another. And it is one of those things, and especially in trying times such as those that we're facing these days, this can sound kind of ridiculous. Like, no, that's too aspirational. We need to, we, we can't actually meet the good of all and the good of each. Um, we have to sort of just meet the good of those that we can. Um, and, you know, again, in trying circumstances, sometimes we can only do, you know, we, in any circumstances, we can only do the best that we can do. But there's just no question here that the aim that we should, that we should aspire to and that we really need to keep at our forefront is the good of all and the good of each. And it, just to name a couple of other things, again, I think they're helpful for us in these times, but they're, they're timeless as well. Uh, one of the best checks that um, the church teaches in terms of are we meeting the common good is actually the question of are we meeting the good of those who are most in need, of those who are most vulnerable? Of course, this is in a lot of ways grounded in this famous passage in the 25th chapter of Matthew's Gospel where uh, Jesus talks about the final judgment. And he, he basically says uh, to, to the groups of people, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me to drink. I was sick or in prison and you visited me, visited me. Or of course, you didn't. And based on that judgment, did you, did you meet my needs or not when you encountered me in the least of these? Uh, he sends people either to their eternal reward or to their eternal punishment. And I think it's, it's, it's a really important thing for us to keep in mind that as we think about the good of all and the good of each, we also have this teaching from, from Scripture. From, you know, it's, Matthew puts it in, in the mouth of Jesus himself saying, the way you treated the one in most need is the way you treated Christ. And so it really is a pretty radical call for us to care for, for all and for each. Um, the two final principles that, that Catholic social thought really comes down on as fundamental are subsidiarity and solidarity. And these, again, I think are crucial for our time. Subsidiarity is the idea that every social problem should be dealt with at the most local uh, community level that it could be dealt with. And yet that the higher levels of community uh, need to be prepared to help the lower levels. Now, of course, the smallest level, which most of us are spending a lot of time with, the, the vital cell of society is the family. Um, and so where possible, the family is, uh, is the, the entity that should make these decisions. But when you need more help from the neighborhood, the church, 
the city, the county, the state, the federal government, uh, that help needs to be offered, and it needs to be offered in a way that doesn't supplant the initiative of the more local organization. And again, we see this uh, played out in terms of uh, the press briefings that our governors make versus those that the federal governments make, right? And those questions of of where the help needs to come from. Uh, we, and we can certainly talk more about that. But the, fi- the final uh, principle that I want to just talk about a little bit here is that of solidarity. And I really want to, uh, our, our Pope John Paul II, now Saint John Paul II, uh, really elevated the principle of solidarity. And he, he talked about it as the bond of independence between us. And it's also a moral virtue where which we, by which we act out of that bond and, and enact that bond. And in fact, he, he said rather famously that solidarity is that virtue by which we commit ourselves in a, in a persevering way to the common good, that is the good of all and of each, because we are really resp- all responsible for all. And again, in this time, you see that uh, as more important than ever to think about the ways that we are indeed all really responsible for the good of all of us, the health of all of us. So what does a principle like solidarity look like in a time of a pandemic? You know, this is a really important question, and I think that it looks different compared, uh, depending on a particular person's uh, role in life. Because what it looks like is, is a positive obligation to commit oneself to the good of all and the good of each. I think, um, I mean, I think about this, I'll, I'll start with for me personally, as somebody who has the great privilege of now, I mean, and responsibility, but also privilege uh, of being able to do all my teaching from uh, my living room, right, Th- through Zoom, uh, to be able to do that. That also gives me a responsibility to stay home and engage in social distancing for, in order to do my part in reducing the, the spread of this illness, right? To take care of uh, family and friends where I can and to, and to, you know, again, stay home. I think, I think uh, social distancing is probably the thing that most of us can do most of the time. But I have a cousin who is a uh, nurse in New Orleans. I have a dear friend who is an emergency room physician in uh, California. Those are people who actually see that responsibility to participate in the common good as going to work and using the gifts that they have honed throughout their careers uh, for the good of all and the good of each in those ways. And I think I will also say that we are paying attention in, at least I personally am paying attention in ways that I hadn't quite before. I mean, the the unsung heroes going to work every day from grocery, uh, grocery clerks to, um, the, the caseworkers at the Providence County mental health center that are delivering meds to people who need them. The truck drivers, the, um, the, the folks who are stocking the shelves in, in every pharmacy and, and, uh, grocery store in throughout the land. It's really like some people participate in the common good by showing up to work. Some people are need to participate in the common good by staying home and slowing the spread and also taking care of family and friends right there in their household, as uh, Holly was talking about before. So are there any limits on what Catholic social thought can offer us in terms of helping us to navigate a crisis like this one? I really don't think that there are. I mean, and, and of course, the the other question in there somewhere would be, well, w- what helps us go beyond those limits? And uh, I think that, it, it, so just to answer this as, as a person of faith, um, at the end of the day, this crisis, like everything else, that we navigate in life 
needs to be navigated in a way that is in keeping with our values. And Catholic social thought really does express, and you know, it's brought together from centuries and centuries and a lot of different cultures, uh, you know, if fa faced plagues before in Catholic social thought, broadly speaking. And the way that Catholic social thought invites us to care for one another in the midst of uh, anything that we face as a society, including this, I think it sets the exact right ground rules for us. Holly, would you like to add something? You know, Michael, I was just going to jump in and say that there is a certain sense in which the principles that Catholic social thought establishes, data is already hinting at this, but um, the, those principles always have to be filled out by individuals given their individual circumstances. It really requires hard thinking on our part sometimes. Um, those answers are not always clear, but every challenge and really particularly an unprecedented challenge like this one, in a way you can see as an invitation to jump in and start figuring out what that means. And I've seen some people do that in remarkable and creative ways. So I think that's really the, the call for all of us. Is there a role that a liberal arts education can play in helping people to, in a sense, fill out um, and apply those principles um, more fully? A liberal arts education at, at its best talks about what it means to be human, talks about what it means to seek truth, goodness, and beauty. Now, those sound very theoretical, but the answers to those questions ground everything that we do. Um, so you could see one connection, for example, Dana noted that Catholic social thought is absolutely committed to the foundational dignity of every single human being. That's an answer to the question, what is a human being? And a liberal arts education trains people to ask and to answer exactly those questions in a way that prepares people for moments like these. This moment is not the time uh, to engage in leisurely conversations about philosophical topics, um, or at least we can say very few of us have the leisure to do that right now. But the great good of a liberal education is that it pre prepares us for these moments and prepares us for other moments like this that we can't see coming, but we know one way or another will arrive. Now, the discourse around the coronavirus has been shifting rapidly over the last couple of months. And recently, it's become almost a refrain for some that in regards to COVID-19, the cure cannot be worse than the disease. And that's usually referring to the economic threat posed by efforts to slow its spread. Holly, what would you say to people, but especially Christians, anxious about economic consequences of shutdowns and other social distancing measures? I certainly would want to say that there are very real concerns involved there. Um, again, I would want to go back and ground ourselves in the fun fundamentals. We start with a commitment to the absolute dignity of human lives and to each individual life. We can move on to another principle very much at play in the Christian tradition, which is that there is very often a call for significant kinds of self-denial and sacrifice. On the other hand, although the Christian tradition often calls people to self-denial and sacrifice, it's very hesitant about us deciding for others what their sacrifice will be. Um, and certainly very hesitant for us to decide for other people that they would sacrifice something as precious as their own lives. So in the end, we don't get a calculated answer here. Um, and I think all of us uh, honestly have come to a moment where we need to extend a lot of patience and even in some cases, compassion to the people who are wrestling through precisely these questions and making these decisions. Uh, but what we can do is go back to those fundamentals and say, 
that there is simply nothing in this equation that is more precious than human life. So insofar as we're asking the economic questions, which we should be doing, um, those questions have to always keep that fundamental commitment at the heart. And if I could add one more thing on this, you know, one of the rich aspects of Catholic social thought is a tradition around the dignity of work and of workers. And in that context, uh, the Catholic social tradition has long sort of had this principle that says, uh, I'm going to say it in two ways here. One is that uh, work was made for human persons, not human persons made for work, right? This is one way that they've kind of resisted this idea that we're cogs in the machine that is the economy. But in fact, um, work is made for us, right? As, as a way for us to actually uh, not only support our families, but also participate in the building up of the common good in, uh, in the ways that each of us find a vocation. But we can also say that more broadly, that um, the economy, uh, w- like we were not made to keep the economy going. The economy was made to keep us going, or to put it a different way, that the human person and the dignity of the human person is always the measure of all of our social institutions and the decisions that we make in them. And I think that that's a way, again, to see how deeply integrated our shared economic life is in that deeper sense of our common good, what it means for all of us and and each of us to be flourishing and flourishing well. And also that it's at the service of us in these more basic ways that we need to um, keep that in the proper context of supporting the health of the entire human community as sort of a primary good. uh, And that, that, that economic good is one that serves that as well. Now in the transition to remote instruction, the agility of many faculty and many students in, in this transition has been nothing short of remarkable, um, just the way that people have been able to adjust so quickly to so dramatic of a change. Um, but this has not been without considerable anxiety um, and without considerable effort. Holly, early on in the transition to remote teaching, you posted the results of an anonymous check-in poll with your students in which every single student expressed some amount of worry about the virus and about transitioning to remote classes. What has this been like for all of them? I've I've continued to hear that kind of response as I've looked for other opportunities to check in with my students. I've certainly imagined the ongoing work of our class to be part of the way that they can address the unsettled feelings that they have. It's not that the material that we study just appears as some kind of a magic bullet, but I have really encourage them when I've had the opportunity to do that, to maintain certain routines and to maintain certain schedules. And I have to say that um, insofar as we've had the opportunity to do some video conferencing as part of our ongoing study together, um, it's been remarkable how great it is to see each other, to, to have an opportunity to actually look at people's faces and hear their voices and find out how they're doing. And my suspicion is that that will probably be even more true as we continue. We have about five or six weeks left of this semester's work. So I hope that we can maintain those connections and um, not just scatter to the winds as the days go on. In your perspectives as um, educators and as theologians, what from the classroom experience can't be replicated remotely? Well, I've, it's an interesting semester for me uh, to have this happen. Uh, one of my classes, Global Service and Solidarity, was supposed to include a spring break trip to Guatemala where we would have spent a week uh, doing various sorts of service and also cultural education in San Lucas Toloman on Lake Atitlan in Guatemala. And that, that trip was rightly canceled by the, by the university uh, with these, as these concerns were growing. Um, but it has been a challenge. The course itself is designed to have reflection on a cross-cultural experience of service. 
uh, that now my students have not been able to to have. So uh, those kinds of experiences are, uh, I think, sort of irreplaceable, to tell you the truth. I will say that in my Catholic social thought class, my students also uh, had a an ongoing uh, community service requirement, which in light of everything with the virus, I just had to say to them, like, no, like this is now extra credit if you were able to get some hours in before, but I'm not going to ask you to go out and serve vulnerable populations. And I actually changed uh, their community service reflection to, to engage this question that you had asked, uh, which is basically um, how how can social distancing serve as a, an, an expression of the moral virtue of solidarity? Um, those are due on Sunday. So I don't, I don't know what they have to say about it quite yet, but uh, I'm looking forward to, to hearing from them about it. And we have talked about it a little bit. And it's certainly the case that they are, they are thinking quite seriously about that. And I, I will say that especially in light of the values of Catholic social thought that we've talked about and the concern for the vulnerable, um, I, have, I have noticed that my students have expressed that quite richly. Uh, many of them have um, a loved one, a, a grandmother or a neighbor, right? Somebody who's elderly, someone who's immunocompromised. Uh, I had a student share about, I think it was the, the infant, a one-year-old, uh, I think, child of a cousin who's, you know, in their social circle and neighborhood and somebody who's immunocompromised and how the whole family is, you know, kind of creating a bubble around that person. Um, and so what, it, it, I mean, it, again, it is very much this embodiment of this very principle we've been talking about. Um, how, do, how do we live our collective lives so that the most vulnerable among us are the most protected? Michael, I would suggest a, a slightly different answer to that question about what's hard to replicate. And that is not so much the specific subject matter of any of the classes that I'm teaching this semester, but more the personal encounter that is at the heart of our um, coming together in the classroom. That would be true for professors in a wide variety of fields, but I think there's something about theology. For us, the encounter between God and humanity, the encounter between and among human persons is just so central to what we're talking about. And for me, in most semesters, that's a crucial part of what I understand myself to be doing, to be allowing the possibility of those kinds of encounters, creating space for them, and sometimes when everything goes really well, watching them happen. I don't think it's impossible to have that kind of encounter uh, at a distance, but certain elements of it are just very hard to recreate. And um, I can feel the way in which certainly at, at Providence College, we are building on some of the relationships that already are in place prior to this sudden change. I feel very grateful that my students and I had several weeks together before we went to this distance format. And so my hope is that, again, we don't lose that completely, but find ways to keep it, keep it alive. And if I could just add, add related to that, that, um, you know, one of the critiques sometimes of theologians and other academics is that uh, we reduce what is an embodied incarnate faith to, you know, just sort of abstract talking heads. And there, there is this feeling when you're, when you're doing so much on Zoom, and I'm, I'm super grateful for, for the ways that Zoom does allow us to connect, but you're literally talking heads on a screen. Um, and, and it does reinforce, I mean, many of us in teaching, whether it's theology or DWC, CIV, um, talk about the need to critique that uh, Cartesian idea that we are just thinking things. But when we're talking heads on a screen, it, re it can reinforce this sense that we are just the thinking things and not these embodied things. Um, and it's in tension with this reality that I think our shared vulnerability to this virus right now 
reminds us that we are in fact embodied and vulnerable in our embodiedness. And so I think that that's, that that's something that, um, I don't know, it's a tension that we're trying to walk in this strange new space. Now, we're all looking forward to going back to what we call normal um, in the aftermath of this. Um, but are you, and this is my final question, but are you hopeful that normal, quote unquote, will mean something slightly or even greatly different in the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic? I would say two things about that. I think that um, there are two sides to this coin, but I think a lot of us are in new ways and unexpected ways having to come face to face with our own vulnerability. Um, I think that's very much what's involved in the anxiety that we report sometimes. But I think there's a certain way in which tapping into that and, and facing it as the truth of our experience can be really salutary, can be good for all of us. Um, and in, in some ways can actually help us to overcome an illusion that we have, that we are self-sufficient, that we are impervious, that we can control everything around us. Um, and if that illusion slips away a little bit, then I, I think it's probably a good thing. Um, the other thing I would say is that I think it gives us the possibility to be reminded of the goodness that is involved in slowing down. Now, that could mean a lot of different things. Um, here, again, I'm thinking of my own experience with my family. Suddenly, we absolutely have the time to gather at the dinner table, whereas in normal life, it feels like we're really fighting for that and trying to compete with a lot of different activities. Um, I think it could be true of other communities and other activities, too. Maybe there is something about, a, about this experience that could call us to simplify in ways that would ultimately be really a good thing. Yeah, I would just add that um, as, as I'm thinking about what the new normal might be, I think, and I, I mean, I, I might have some contrast with, uh, with Holly in terms of there's fewer people in my house and, and I'm more extroverted and I, uh, I, I desperately miss gathering with people and the sorts of uh, informal running into somebody. And I mean, I, I connect to many people in this way, but I don't get to informally run into somebody in the hallway and, and connect in those, in those much more spontaneous ways. And I would say that one of my, one of my hopes is that uh, this, this does help us to think about those relationships much more intentionally and to cultivate them better um, and to celebrate them more, to, to take that time, um, you know, again, not just with the people who are closest to us in terms of family, but those people that I never realized how much I appreciated the person whose door I just walked down, you know, past his office several times a week or, or those kinds of things to really, um, find ways to, to build and to celebrate those communities that we're missing right now. Well, Holly and Dana, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Thanks again, Michael, for the invite. It was great to talk with you. Yes, thank you. Subscribe to the Providence College podcast in all the usual places, including Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify. If you like what you hear, please review and share with others. Thank you to our producer, Chris Judge, and thank you for listening. And as always, go Friars.